Our text today is James 5, 7 through 11. I think this will be our last sermon from the letter of James, even though there is still more to the letter. I encourage you to read the entire chapter 5 in your own time. But I chose this, this portion to preach on today, entitled, Be Patient Until the Coming of the Lord. Let's read the text. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are compassionate and merciful. In this text, you call us to be uh, patient and to endure until the coming of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We can only do that, Lord, with your help, with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, use this exhortation from the letter of James to, to, to establish our hearts and to help us to be patient until his coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so the main point really is in verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. The main command is, is right there at the beginning. Be patient. You could translate that, be long-suffering or endure. I like that word, long-suffering, because if we're commanded to be patient, it's implied that we'll have to suffer some things. We're, we're having to go through some things that we would rather not have to go through. And, and such is the Christian life, <laughs> as long as we live <laughs> until the coming of the Lord. Moises Silva says that James speaks here of the patience needed to cope with all the trials and tribulations of this world until the parousia. Parousia is a word that means coming. It's straight from the Greek. It means coming, coming of the Lord. And so just think about some of these trials and tribulations that Christians have to, have to suffer with. Um, one of the letters in the New Testament says that everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Okay, so we receive persecution from the enemies of the gospel. Also, um, there's, there's, beyond just the world, there's, there's temptations that arise from our own flesh. Um, there's the devil who, who's, who's out to, to get us. Um, there's, there's the stuff that we have to deal with because we live in a broken and fallen world, like sickness, decay, death. There's tragedies, right? There's fights and quarrels. All, all these things we need to be patient about until the coming of the Lord. Also, in, in uh, James 5, 1 through 6, which we didn't read right before the sermon text, it's a warning against the, the rich. And, and chapter 5, verse 4 talks about those rich people, rich farmers, perhaps, who were holding back wages from those who were laboring in their fields. Um, perhaps James has in mind some of those poor Christians who were working for landowners, uh, but who weren't getting paid or who were getting taken advantage of in some way. Uh, to all this, James says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. It's very similar to what he said in the first chapter. Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Very similar idea to what he's, he's talking about now at the end of the letter. Peter Davids writes that the Christian hope is the coming of Christ when all the wrong suffered will be set right. That is our hope. When, when Jesus comes, he's going to make everything right again. Um, he, he's going to judge the wicked and, and he's going to destroy this whole world and make a brand new world, um, which will be like the Garden of Eden. Um, and, 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 and perfect righteousness and justice will dwell there. I want to look at a few promises where Jesus says he's going to come again. Um, First one from John 14, 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. A very clear promise. He says, I will come again and I will take you to myself. Another one from Mark chapter 13. And then they will see the Son of Man. That's how Jesus refers to himself often. They will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. <clears throat> 
And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Here's one from the book of Acts. Right after Jesus ascended or was taken up into heaven, uh, the disciples kept looking into the sky and and an angel appeared and said, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And that's what we're waiting for. And James calls us to be patient until the coming of the Lord, until the return of Christ. He, he continues in chapter 5, verse 7. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. Peter David says that the picture is that of a small farmer in Palestine. I want to share with you what David writes about Uh, potentially what James had in mind. He says, The small farmer plants his carefully saved seed and hopes for a harvest, living on short rations and suffering hunger during the last weeks. The whole livelihood of the family depends on a good harvest. The loss of the farm, semi-starvation, or death could result from a bad year. So the farmer waits for an expected future event. No one but he could know how precious the grain really is. He must exercise patience, no matter how hungry he is, for he waits with a view toward the coming harvest. This patience must last until he receives the early and the late rain. And so this is the picture that James gives us. In verse 7, we are to be like that farmer, waiting for the rain, waiting for the harvest, but really we are waiting for our Lord to come again. So in verse 8, he says, You also, that is, just like that farmer, you also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. He already said be patient in verse 7, but here he expands it with this phrase, Establish your hearts. Make sure that your hearts are set on the Lord Jesus Christ and on the promises of his coming again. Okay, Uh, establish your hearts now so that when uh, trials and tribulations come your way, that that, that your faith won't waver uh, or or get blown over like a house of cards. Instead, you have a firm foundation. No matter what happens, you are going to follow Jesus. You believe that he is your Savior. He died for your sins. He rose again. And just as certainly as he died and rose again, he is coming again. Okay, establish your hearts. Kind of like a... A sea captain, right? There, there's nothing that's going to make this this captain leave the helm. Doesn't matter how fierce that storm is going to get. He's not going to leave the helm. James wants us to be that way about following our Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what happens in this life. And then in verse eight, he gives us the reason why we should be patient and establish our hearts, because the coming of the Lord is at hand, or because or for the coming of the Lord is near. This is the reason why we should be patient. And by the way, it's a lot easier to be patient if we know that the coming of the Lord is near and not far off. Uh, The same thing with establishing our hearts. This verse is a great encouragement to us who believe in him, who are nonetheless suffering uh, because of following Christ. It's a great encouragement. It's very similar to Romans 8, 18, where Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And he has in mind here uh, the, the glorious coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he comes, he will invite all of us who believe in him to share with him in his glory and to have a glorious eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. And when we get there, we'll see that, that, that what we're going through here on this earth today is like nothing, not even worth comparing to, to the splendor of the glory that we'll have with Christ in eternity. So I was thinking of this phrase in 518, the coming of the Lord is at hand. And I was thinking that some of you may be asking yourselves, is the COVID-19 pandemic a sign of the end times? And so I want to speak to that, take a tangent, rabbit trail for a little bit, but I think we'll get back on track soon. First of all, I want to note that there have been many pandemics or plagues throughout the centuries. Uh, Many of them have been worse than this. But I want to look at this passage from Luke 21, uh, 10 and 11. Jesus said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places, famines and pestilences. 
Okay, pestilences is a old biblical word for diseases or sicknesses or, or plagues even. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. And so here you have it, just looking at these verses, we would say, okay, yeah, pestilences along with these other things are a sign of the second coming of Jesus Christ. But I will say, I will caution, not so fast, because if you look at the context, Jesus is actually giving some signs about the destruction of the temple. In verse 6, um, Jesus says, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. He's talking about the, the stones of the temple. And the disciples, are, or they asked him, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And then Jesus goes on from there, and he gives some signs uh, of things that will take place in connection with the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem. You can see this in outline form. Here's an outline of Luke 21. I just want to highlight that, that the first portion is about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. The second portion of this chapter is about the end of the world, when, when Jesus returns. And that little bit in verse t verses 10 and 11 about um, earthquakes and famines and pestilences, that's, that's in this section, signs that will accompany the destruction of the temple. Okay, so I hope that gives a little bit of clarity to that question, but I'm going to speak out of both ends of my mouth here. Here's a picture of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Okay, it took place about 40, uh, 40 years after Jesus was crucified. Like the flood and like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis, so also the destruction of Jerusalem is a type and preview of the final judgment day. And so it's not without warrant to, to, to say that the kinds of things that happened in connection with the, with the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem may very well be the kinds of things associated also with the coming of Christ on the last day for the final judgment. These things are connected in some way. <clears throat> um, here's a passage from Mark 13 where Jesus says, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and there will be famines. These are but the beginning of birth pains. This is very similar to the passage um, in Luke that I shared with you, except Luke adds there will be famines and pestilences, okay? Jesus likely said that for whatever reason Mark didn't record it. But what Mark says is that these things are but the beginning of birth pains, meaning um, these kinds of things will continue to happen um, from the time that Jesus said these words until the time that he comes again. Um, the point of these passages whether it's in Mark 13 or Luke 21, is not so much to tell us when exactly Jesus is coming, but I think his point is given in like Luke 21, 19. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Okay, whatever happens, you need to endure. Um, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. That's his main point. Um, <clears throat> other verses, he says things like, be on your guard, be ready, endure. That's the point of these passages, and I argue that, that James has the same exact point in chapter 5. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Let's go on to uh, James. Uh, we're done with that tangent now. Uh, back to James 5, uh, verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And so grumbling against one another is the exact opposite of being patient as we wait for the Lord to come. James doesn't want us to have fights and quarrels among us. Those spring from our sinful passions. We read about that in chapter 4. Here he doesn't want us to grumble against one another, much like the Israelites did uh, when they were rescued from Egypt and from slavery, taken through the Red Sea. But pretty soon they got thirsty and hungry and they were complaining. Moses, it would have been better for us to stay as slaves in Egypt. At least when we were there, we had enough to drink and enough to eat. Now we're going to die of, of starvation or we're going to die of extreme thirst. Um, they were grumbling and that angered the Lord. What their grumbling manifested really was a lack of trust in the Lord's promise. It also manifested a lack of love. And friends, we should ask ourselves, how often do we do the same thing? How often do we grumble against one another? How often do we grumble uh, against the Lord or, or the messengers of the Lord who teach his word? Um, so often our grumbling, our complaining really manifests a lack of trust uh, 
in the Lord and a lack of love for one another. And so James says, do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. We see it comes with a warning here, okay? So the implication is if we keep grumbling against one another, we will be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And what I want to point out here is that the second coming of Christ in Scripture can be presented as either gospel or as law, as good news or as a warning and a rebuke. Um, I would argue in verse 7, the coming of the Lord is presented as gospel to brothers in Christ who are who are suffering persecution, maybe being defrauded, this or that, trials and tribulations. James says, be patient. The Lord will come soon. He will set all things right. He will vindicate you. He will come again and take you to himself. Be patient. However, in verse 9, it, it's, it's, hey, the judge is standing at the door. And if you keep grumbling against one another without repenting, you will be judged on that day. You will not, <laughs> Jesus will not be happy with you on that day unless you repent of your grumbling. And so I think we should all consider that. When Christ returns, how is he going to come to us? What will our reaction be? When we see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven with, with great glory and with his angels, are we going we gonna to lift up our heads because we're so excited to see our glorious Savior? Or instead, are we going to run away and take shelter because we're so afraid of our terrible judge? And that's why the scripture says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Repent and believe in the gospel. Going on, James 5, verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Here we see that, that suffering and patience go together. Um, and the prophets are a great example of those who, who suffered because they were following the Lord, speaking in his name, and yet they were patient about it. I immediately thought of Jeremiah. Here's a cartoon of Jeremiah. Um, they're not actually helping him. At this point, the Bible says, um, that they let him down by ropes into a cistern because they were sick and tired of him preaching God's word to them. And so they, they shut him up in that hole. Okay, that's just one example. The book right before James is the book of Hebrews, where in chapter 11, he talks about what, what the prophets suffered. Okay, and, and I'm not going to list the whole verses. I just kind of did bullet points here. Some of the prophets were tortured. Others Others suffered mocking and flogging. Others suffered chains and imprisonment. Some of them were stoned. I think of in the New Testament, Stephen was stoned. Some of them were sawn in two. I didn't look into this beyond my study Bible note that said that some ancient writers said that this happened to the prophet Isaiah. Other prophets were killed with the sword. They went about in, in skins of sheep and goats. They were destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. Okay, this is what the prophets suffered for following the Lord, for speaking his word, and yet they didn't forsake the Lord. They established their hearts to follow him and his word. And friends, we should ask ourselves, if God allowed his chosen servants, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, to go through this stuff, what makes us think that, that, that we would be spared from this stuff? Okay, it's not necessarily a sign that God doesn't love us. It might be a sign that God is using us if we're suffering. So what's the point of Hebrews 11? Uh, the point is actually given in chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. This is very similar to James's point. In chapter 5, verse 7, where he says, Be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. We'll go on. James 5, 11, um, it says, Bless, Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. Um, the obvious, obvious implication is that we should, we should also remain steadfast and we will be blessed. Um, this is like a bookend with what James said in chapter 1, 12. This is the last chapter, chapter 5, 11. In the first chapter, James said this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. And so James is saying that the same exact thing in, in the first chapter and in the last chapter. 
He continues, uh, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And so here, just he mentions the name Job, and we're supposed to remember the book of Job and all that Job had at the beginning, and then how Satan uh, you know, asked God for permission to take it all away from Job and to see if he'll still love the Lord and follow the, follow the Lord. And, and sure enough, Satan takes everything away. God allows that to happen, and he suffers much. He loses his family, loses wealth. Uh, he, he, he gets sores all over his body. But, but he doesn't curse God. He, he, he questions God quite a bit, but, but he follows the Lord. He doesn't forsake him. And then James says, you have seen the purpose of the Lord. You could translate this, um, this word. You have seen the end result or the outcome that the Lord brought about. And we're supposed to remember how in the last chapter of Job, God multiplied everything that, that Job once had that was taken away so that by the end, God blessed Job with even more children and more livestock and more wealth than he ever had before. And James is saying, guys, the same sort of thing will happen to us if we remain steadfast. God will also richly reward us with more than we can ever think or imagine. And this reward is coming to us when our Lord Jesus Christ returns from heaven to save all of us who are eagerly waiting for him. And so what is James's point in this section? It should be clear by now. It's this, be patient until the coming of the Lord. Establish your hearts and, and, and be uh, steadfast. You, you will be blessed if you remain steadfast like Job. That's the point of this section. I hope that, that it has encouraged your hearts to be patient until the coming of the Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he is, he is near. He, he will come soon in the glory uh, of his Father with, with many holy angels. And I want you to remember that the one who is coming again is also the one who suffered and died for all of your sins. And so if you have been convicted of sin in this sermon or, or from the Holy Spirit, from, from some other uh, thing in your life, Simply take that to the Lord, confess it to him, and know that the Lord Jesus Christ suffered for you to forgive you of all your sins. And after suffering and dying on the third day, Jesus rose again from the dead. And just as surely as he rose again from the dead, he's coming again from heaven. And here's the promise of the gospel, that everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of all of their sins and the promise of eternal life. And James's point for us today is to hang on, Christians, be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Amen.